You know, words do matter, especially when it comes to cooking, because having the correct cooking vocabulary actually makes your cooking easier. And I'm going to show you how today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Welcome back to the Carefree Cook's Code, everyone. You know it. We're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. If this surprises you, you should have gone to webcookingclasses.com slash live and registered for my alert system because I always send out alerts before we're about to go live because we're the carefree cooks. Remember, we create our own recipes. This brings friends and family together, especially around the holidays because we learn every time we cook. It's it's a progression and a journey. It's not just one cookbook. Uh, we define our own cooking styles. Why? Because we practice pro methods and we wind up really loving our cooking. That's the whole idea. Uh, you know, I'm a stickler for words. I have to admit it. I don't know if you're like me, but I, I, I think words have a lot of weight to them. And I think the right words in the right situation are very, very important. And because words do matter, especially when you're the executive chef of a large kitchen or you're trying to run your catering company, like I have, but okay, blah, 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 Chef Todd, this and that. Well, what about you? What about if you're just attempting to coordinate the largest family dinner of the year in your own home? The words you use can actually have an effect on the food that you serve. All right, I'm gonna, it sounds crazy, but I'm going to show you why in just a minute. Uh, but first, I've got a true or false for you today. Getting into the holiday season, I know the spuds are going to be flying here in the U.S. The true or false, please tell me in the comments below, is this statement food true or food false? Most of the potatoes nutrition is found in the skin true or false in the comments below. No explanations. <laughs> don't, don't ruin it for everyone else with a psychological, uh, yeah, a, a scientific explanation. It is simply true or false. Most of the potatoes nutrition is found in the skin. Okay. Hey everybody. Hello. All my friends are with me. Goodness. I see my phone scrolling like crazy. All our friends are with us today. Deborah Reed and Jane and Carol uh, from Wales and Jeff and Joseph and Pat and Guy is with us and Michael and Scott. All our friends are here. Welcome everyone. Grammy's joining us and Paul is with us and Greg. Okay. I can't just read numbers. Numbers, but thank you so much. Pe more and more people joining as we go. More and more people joining as this year progresses because we, this is the busiest time of year for people that like to cook, right? It, and if you like to bring friends and family together, yeah, then it's especially the busiest time of the year. So from mid-November, probably right through New Year's, more demands are going to be placed on your cooking and entertaining skills than any other time of the year. Uh, think about it. When else does Aunt Mildred visit from Topeka? <laughs> you know, she doesn't come often, but when she does, you want to try and put out a nice spread for her, right? So this is why I'm here for Aunt Mildred from Topeka. <laughs> I want to help you. I really do. I want to help as many people as I can this year. And there's nothing I can do about Aunt Mildred's crazy opinions. She's going to have them at the dinner table. I can do nothing about that. But I can try and help make your cooking easier, more creative, more fun this year. And believe it or not, it starts with the words that you use in the kitchen. And you might want to take notes today, okay? I got a lot of words for you. You might want to start building your holiday cooking vocabulary here and now, today. So I'll pause for a second if you need to get a piece of paper or 
pen or, or something like that. Uh, but for lifetime members of web cooking classes, I've gone ahead and uh, put a notes page together for you. I'm going to post this finished notes page in our Carefree Cooks community at the end of today's broadcast. So you can download it later. You have all the stuff that we talked about that goes in our members only community on Facebook. So what I wanted to tell you about today, you know, there, there's an orientation day in culinary school. It's Technically, it's the first day of class, but I never really call it that. You know, there's a lot of awkwardness. There's they're brand new students. They don't have their uniforms yet. You know, they're standing there in my culinary school lab in their street clothes. And I don't like people in street clothes in, in my lab. So they're like fledglings. You know, they, they don't have their knife kits yet. They're not there to cook. They're not going to cook for quite a while. They're there really to find out about culinary school. That's the way I look at this orientation day in culinary school. They're thinking, what's this going to be like, right? There's a whole lot of fear, trepidation, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unconfident looks in the student's eyes. I see this on this orientation day and to allay some of their fears, right? I don't want it to start out seeming so difficult and so horrible. We got to start with something easy. They need a win, right? They, they got to come away from this first day where they can actually learn something and be proud and look forward to coming back the next day, right? You, you don't want to scare them. When I went to culinary school, the guy scared us, right? He was the imposing, yelling, militaristic chef. I'm not that way. We all know that. I want these people to have a win on orientation day. You got to give them a win in their minds so that they're excited to move forward. And we don't start with the food. We don't bother with the spices, right? We're not cutting stuff up yet. We start with the words. We need to speak the same language in the kitchen and to run a commercial kitchen with a dozen or dozens for that matter of chefs like I have, you need smooth communication. And the first thing that we do on this orientation day at culinary school is we go over all the cool gadgets, the stacks of pots and pans, and we give them all their appropriate name to memorize. Now, I know you might be rolling your eyes and some of the students do, but this gets serious in a commercial kitchen because there's a full sheet pan, then there's a half sheet pan, there's a quarter sheet pan, there's a third sheet pan, there's a fifth sheet pan, there's a two inch full hotel pan, uh, there's a two inch half hotel pan, there's a third four inch hotel pan, and there's a third six inch hotel pan. There's a sixth pan, there's an eighth pan, there's a big difference between a 12 inch saute pan and a 12 inch frying pan. We have a chinois to strain the liquids. There's a rondeau for braising. There is even a spider for removing items from liquids. So why do the students have to know each and every name of all these pots and pans and stuff on the very first day? That's because it's part of the communication with the chef. So imagine this. <clears throat> I say to a student or somebody working with me in one of the places that I've worked, when the soup is done, please portion it into a four inch eighth pan for service. You better know what a four inch eighth pan is. There's a reason I have that pan. There's a steam table laid out. It's like a puzzle. That's where it sits. And if, if I give you a direction like, like um, <clears throat> okay, we're doing a stir fry, all right? So please saute the broccoli in the rondo so that all the broccoli is cooked consistently. And if I come walking around and I see you with four different saute pans, we're not communicating well, <laughs> right? This is where this tradition of yes, chef comes in. And this is also part of the orientation class in culinary school. The students are taught that the reply to a direction from me or any other chef is yes, chef. And, you know, I, I once overheard a student telling another one that he's going to refuse. This is what he said. I'm going to refuse to say yes, chef. His career is going to go real well, but I'm going to refuse to say yes, chef because I'm not going to kiss his ass that way. That's what he said. I'm not going to kiss his ass. Kiss my ass? You're missing the entire point, man. The point is about communication. 
And if he's one of the 60 chefs frantically running around trying to get dinner service done for an entire hospital or 15,000 people at the NSA, and I ask him to prepare an ingredient, I need to know he heard me. Yes, chef is an affirmation. It's not ass kissing, all right? That's the idea. So similarly, I need to be clear in the communication when I'm directing other chefs. I can't say to them like, hey, would you cut me some carrots, uh, make them kind of big, uh, not too big and kind of small, but not too small. <laughs> That's silly. That's why we have specific names of the classic vegetable cuts. You know, it reminds me that there's a classic Saturday Night Live sketch. I think it's William Shatner. Um, he plays the manager of a nuclear power plant who's retiring. And they're holding his retirement party for him. And as he leaves, they're like, yay, clapping and stuff. And with an absolute monotone and no expression whatsoever, the guy retiring from the nuclear power plant, he turns and he says, remember, you can't put too much water in the reactor. And he leaves. So the first guy says, all right, open the valves, everyone. <laughs> we, we need to put as much water as possible. He said, you can't put too much water in the reactor. The next worker goes, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. That's not what he said. He said, you can't put too much water in the reactor. So we should probably take some out. And as they continue arguing about it, the nuclear power plant blows up. It's a comedy sketch, okay? But my point is communication needs to be clear. So when I direct a prep cook and I ask for an ingredient, it's always going to be something like four pounds carrot julienne. And the reply will be, yes, chef. And that's why it's important. If you're running multi-million dollar kitchens, you need that communication. But this is where it gets back to you and your table. You're not running a food production machine that feeds thousands of people every day. You're feeding your family for the holidays, and that's what I really want to talk about. Yes, Aunt Mildred is an eating machine. That woman can pack it away, but that's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the production of your meal. And it's just as important that you're aware of the important vocabulary words in your cooking at home as it is in the commercial kitchen. If you want confidence, if you want consistency, if you want pride in your cooking, then the words do matter. And I have people send me questions all the time with, with words I just don't understand. They're not cooking words, so I can't answer some of these questions. So I want to go over a few of the words that are going to come in handy this holiday season. Let's start with some of the prep words, specifically those classic knife cuts that we drill into their heads in culinary school. First is julienne. Julienne is a stick that measures two inches by an eighth inch or five centimeters by three millimeters. There's batonette. Batonette is a stick that's about twice as big, a little bit longer, two and a quarter inches by a quarter inch or five centimeters by six millimeters. Brunois is an eighth inch or a three millimeter cube. And small dice is a quarter inch or a six millimeter cube. So why is this important? <laughs> Let me explain. You're thinking, why do I care about this, Todd? This sounds like such culinary school snottery, <laughs> but I just made a word, but it's not. If you're trying to interpret grandma's old recipe this holiday season, she's probably not using these words, right? She's using a bunch of, one large onion, medium amounts of things, right? One rounded tablespoon, these things that they're unquantifiable in that regard. So maybe when you're redoing grandma's recipes this year, maybe you should fill in for the next generation, the specific instructions so that we're a little more precise. Use your cooking vocabulary. So your grandkids know what you're talking about. So you look at some of these dishes and you go, is it a better dish with thin sticks of carrots and celery? Or is it a better dish with medium cubes of celery? And you make the decisions. But instead of using the words like medium that can't be quantified, let's try and get a better definition to your words. And if somebody's helping you prepare the dinner, right? If you've got a helper, not like dozens of chefs like I had, but maybe it's your daughter or a friend or something like that. You can show them, you can pass this along and show them what small dice means to you. 
But remember, you're not being tested in culinary school. As long as you remember the consistency of cut is consistency of cook, your julienne doesn't need to be exactly three millimeters wide. It's good, as long as they're all about the same, but you're speaking to what the thing should actually look like. And I won't tell anyone that your julienne is a millimeter off. No worries, all right? All right, let's talk about more prep words. There's par cook and blanch. One of my best tips for the holiday cooking this year is to par cook or blanch as many items as you can. This is what a restaurant does. This is what a catering company does. But a lot of people don't understand these words or they don't understand the concepts behind them. And it's mostly used with vegetables, but you can par cook a chicken breast you can par cook steaks and hamburgers, and actually, this is what your local steakhouse is already doing. It takes way too long <laughs> for them to cook that thick steak from raw. So generally, sous chef comes in early, they par cook items, they grill mark the steaks, and then they put them in the cooler to be finished off in a really hot oven so it doesn't take 35 to 45 minutes for you to get your steak, you know? So you can par cook things just to finish them in the oven or reheat them. Or like if you're making chicken breast for chicken salad, yeah, you want to grill mark it outside maybe, but you don't want it to dry out on the grill. So maybe you steam it to finish and keep it moist. You get what I'm saying about par cooking? Grill mark then steam is more moisture than grill. And if you really want to save some time this holiday season, blanching is one of the best ways to do it. I am a big believer in blanching. It's for vegetables. Really, it means partially cooking, par cooking. Also, a lot of words are interchangeable, but I see it as vegetables. What you do is you par cook them in a liquid, you blanch them in a liquid, but then you shock them in ice water to stop the cooking. You don't throw your steak or chicken breast in ice water. So you can blanch the string beans before they get mixed with your bechamel sauce or your canned mushroom soups. And so they're already mostly cooked. And then all you need to do is heat them up at the end, heat them in the sauce that they're in, saves time on the day. You can blanch potatoes for much quicker reheating uh, than you can mash them or make potato salad closer to the meal. That's a half hour or 45 minutes of cooking potatoes that you get solved the day of the meal. You can blanch fresh fruit like peaches or apples to get them ready for your pies. This loosens the skin if you wanna peel them. This saves a lot of time later. Par cooking and blanching should be part of your vocabulary this holiday season, no doubt. Saves time when you do it correctly. All right, so we're still on the prep stages of the biggest meal that you're going to have to cook all year long. And Aunt Mildred is on our back every step of the way. Aunt Mildred knows better no matter what we're doing. Get Aunt Mildred out of the kitchen right now. Please distract her somehow. She's such a know-it-all and she, she, <laughs> she has nothing to do. <sighs> she has nothing to do ever since Fred fell down the well. But that's a story <laughs> for another day because we're moving on to trussing and larding. I, hey, I cracked myself up. I can tell you. Trussing and larding are important at the holidays as well. Trussing is when you tie up your meat. <laughs> stuff, stuffed, <clears throat> stuffed roasts are trussed with butcher's twine, right? You get yourself some butcher's twine, whole pol poultry that you stuff in the cavity, you tie the legs together, things like that. This is a skill if you're gonna do an open pork loin, a butterflied rump roast that you stuff with the rice stuffing or whatever that you want. This is an important skill to be able to trust things, things like that. And if you're a lifetime member of web cooking classes, you've seen my deboning the whole chicken video where I take all the bones out of the chicken, we fill it with white and wild rice, and then we truss it back together with butcher's twine. It's crazy because then you can carve a whole chicken like you do like a roast. The knife goes right through it. No bones. Larding, you already do. You just don't know the term. Larding is when you add fat to a roasted item. So when you're roasting your turkey this year, you're probably going to put a few strips of bacon on top, right? You can admit it. You, you really don't know why. <laughs> you do it every year. You put bacon on the bird. You, you don't know why. It's probably mostly because that's the way mom did it. And mom would tell you that's the way grandma did it. And if you ask grandma, she'd probably tell you that's the way great grandma did it and so on. But really what everybody has been doing is larding their turkey and the rendered fat from the bacon is meant to brown the skin. 
but really it mostly runs down to the bottom of the pan is what happens. Larding, <laughs> larding over the skin is not the best idea. Now, larding under the skin is an entirely different story. If you make a compound butter and you can get it under the skin of your bird, entirely different story in retaining moisture. Oh, and speaking of it, while I'm on the topic, let me tell you that basting is a useless myth. If you've got one of those syringe looking like turkey basters with a rubber ball on the end, please go ahead and throw it away or use it to bathe your parakeet or something. The amount of oven temperature that you lose every time you open the door to squirt hot fat that's gone from the bottom of the top and immediately runs to the bottom of the again, it's not worth opening the oven door. Throw your turkey baster away. There are better ways to keep your turkey moist. All right, so let's get to the actual cooking now. And it might seem like semantics, but baking and roasting are different. Baking is reserved for things that are baked in the oven. <laughs> okay, the, the term is used for baked goods. All right, I'm defining the word with the word. I get, I get, let me be more specific. Pastries, pies, breads, cookies, doughs that rise, things that leaven when you add heat, uh, sweet things that get sweeter because of caramelization of sugars. Those are the things that we bake. But to use the correct words, everything else is roasted. And I know you'll have a tremendous debate in the comment section today because you'll say, what about a baked potato? What about baked ham? And so on. Yeah, go ahead, debate among yourselves. But you roast your turkey. You don't bake it. You actually roast your casseroles. Roasting is what you do with root vegetables on a sheet pan in the oven. You don't bake them. And when you apply heat to an item and it stiffens and shrinks and it renders fat and it loses weight through evaporation of moisture, it is a roasted item. And most of what you're going to be doing over the holidays is roasting when it comes to a big meal. So wouldn't you think it would make sense to really look into what the roasting method entails? You should do your holiday baking actually a few days before you do your roasting. Otherwise your apple pie is gonna smell like it was larded. <laughs> That's a great, that is a great chef joke. Right? If you put the turkey in and the oven smells like bacon and then you put the apple pie in, you could say that I larded my apple pie. Oh, that's a great joke. I gotta, I gotta save that for the chef's convention next year. But only we get it, right? Most people wouldn't get that. But look, at the holidays, you're not grilling, you're not smoking, you're probably not pan frying or deep frying, you're usually roasting. So unless you're talking about moist cooking methods, you, you gotta get your words straight. Proteins in the oven, dry is roasting. Now, moist cooking methods are very important at the holidays as well. Steaming, simmering, poaching, and remember, boiling is not a cooking method. The temperature is way too high and the environment is way too violent. You should not be boiling anything in your kitchen. And Again, have at it in the comments section if you want, because you're going to tell me about your boiled eggs. You're going to tell me about boiled chicken. But the truth of the matter is both of those things should actually be simmered. So let's go over the moist cooking methods while we can. We've got steaming. Steaming is an indirect moist heat process applied to food positioned above the steam. That's important. Where simmering is direct contact with the heat, small bubbles around the outside of the pan and a very slight movement to the liquid. Simmering is a lower temperature and a lot less violent than boiling is. And then there's poaching. Poaching is also a moist cooking method with convective heat, but the liquid barely moves and there are no visible bubbles. Poaching is great for delicate items that the violent boil would pull apart. And knowing the difference between boil, simmer, and poach, as well as the correct steaming procedures will help you with that blanching that we just talked about a minute ago, right? These are very important words because the, the cooking methods are so incredibly different this time of year. And this can all mean great success or, you know, just mediocre results for your holiday meal. So let's get into some baking words right now. How about the difference between combine, stir, and whip? This has to do with the amount of air 
that you want to put into your dough or batter and the amount of gluten that you want to develop through moisture and mixing. Combine is the very delicate procedure where you're usually just putting two things into one. And if you've ever made a meringue pie, a chocolate mousse, a souffle, an angel food cake, a chiffon pie, you're combining a whipped egg whites that are holding a lot of air, right, with a dry ingredient that could immediately deflate that foam, so you want to delicately combine. That's why we combine, we don't knock the air out of something. Things that are stirred get a consistent mixture of all the ingredients and stirring and blending sometimes used interchangeable. And there are no worries about that delicate egg white foam or over mixing when you're stirring. It's just the idea to, to make something into one consistent mixture, but whipping is important. Whipping means incorporating air. And this is so important in all of baking from cookies to cakes, to pies, to all of it. If grandma's lemon, lemon chiffon pie says whip the egg whites, grandma wants you to get as much air into that pie as possible where combining is gentle and kind of protective. Stirring is rather arbitrary. Whipping is the one that is most important in baking. In old cookbooks, whipping might be called beating to beat the eggs. And speaking of which, if you've got an electric mixer, that whip attachment, the one with the wires, it's only meant to incorporate air into batters. It is not used for combining or stirring. That's what the paddle attachment is for, for making your cookies and things like that. All right, I'm running way short on time here. Lastly, there are, they're not words per se. There's a vocabulary of temperatures that I would be irresponsible if I didn't include for your holiday cooking, because this is very important. This is the difference between well and ill in your cooking. Cooking. Knowing your finished cooking temperatures means that you can always be assured that your food is hot, it's fully cooked, and it's safe. And if you're cooking a whole bird, a goose, a chicken, a turkey, any other poultry, you should take the temperature at the thickest part of the bird, usually between the thigh and the carcass. And if your bird is stuffed, then you definitely want to take the temperature at the deepest part of the cavity because the stuffing can absorb the liquids from the bird and be just as hazardous as the raw meat. So it's advised that raw poultry should be cooked to 165 Fahrenheit or 74 Celsius internal finish temperature. Many people will tell you higher. And as long as you're say brining your bird, as long as you're using my bottom up cooking method for the bird, it won't lose that much moisture, but I wouldn't recommend cooking it to 185 if you're not doing any of those tricks. So I also normally let my bird sit around 30 minutes or so. Let the temperature rise another 10 degrees Fahrenheit. The juices will settle and so on. Don't take it out of the oven and start carving it. And anything that's not hazardous, like all those blanched potatoes we just talked about, all those blanched vegetables, they just need to be heated up. And since the human mouth is 98.6 Fahrenheit or about 37 Celsius, just almost anything hotter than that is good enough, right? It's not hazardous. Why spend hours heating up the string bean casserole when it doesn't need to be boiling to be served at the table? You're, you're taking up valuable oven time and you're probably overcooking those beans that are, they're already cooked because you blanched them like I showed you a few minutes ago. And the last temperature you need to know is 40 degrees Fahrenheit or four degrees Celsius, four and a half or so. And that's the temperature that you should cool your leftovers down to within four hours. That means that you should leave things uncovered in the refrigerator at first. If you wrap things tightly while they're still hot, they take a lot longer to cool down. Don't stack things on top of each other because the key to cooling things is the air circulation. Let the air get all around those leftovers and then cover or wrap them for the night because tomorrow you've got some plans for those leftovers. If if you're following me, you're going to have plans of those leftovers. And I love cooking with leftovers because leftovers have no rules. That's the thing that I love. So let's start this holiday season with the words that really matter. The ones that will give you a little bit more focus into the preparation, the cooking, the baking, the reheating of all your holiday meals, the ones that make you proud. And you know, there's going to be a lot of holiday cooking help coming your way over the next few weeks. And we've started today very slowly. Like I said, I want to give everyone a win. 
You want to be successful early on. So we start with the words, the words that do matter once you start cooking. And so let me tell you what's coming up in the next few weeks. I know I'll go over time a little bit, but this is worth it. Here's what's coming up over the next few weeks so we can all have the best holiday cooking season ever. Next week, I'm going to dive even deeper into holiday cooking methods that you're going to use most often over the holidays. And then the next week, we're going to talk about marinating and brining, getting ready for the holidays uh, so that you can add more moisture and flavor to the things that you cook. Then we're going to talk about holiday pot luck, how to impress people at this party you're going to be invited to. That'll be about three weeks from now. We'll talk about holiday service styles. Maybe you don't just put all the food on the middle of the table. We'll talk about that about four weeks from now. And I also have seven, seven live cooking episodes planned for the coming month. I'm going to be popping up on Thursdays and or Saturdays, depending when. Be sure you're part of my message alert system for the holidays because I'm, I'm going to be on your computer. I'm going to be on your tablet. I'm going to be on your phone more than Santa Claus over the next six weeks or so. Uh, let's go into our carefree Cooks community, see who is cooking with vocabulary <laughs> today as well. I love this one. Rose started out with a butternut squash soup, and she correctly said in the comments that she roasted the squash instead of baked it. I like that. Thank you, Rose, for using the right word. You didn't bake the squash, you roasted it. But this is what I love. The other thing she said, she said, quote, I have made this soup a few times before I understood the methods and became a carefree cook, but it never turned out like this one did and I couldn't be more thrilled. See, Rose, nicely done, Rose. She's starting out the holidays right. Uh, it's a time of year to dig out that family heritage recipe and that's what Lauren did this week. This is her mother-in-law's 1977 recipe for apple pie. And if you look at it closely there, you will see uh, margarine and an entire can of Crisco. Luckily, thank you. Woo, you scared me, Lauren, because <laughs> these things need to be updated. She said that she changed the Crisco to butter and she likes it much better. And she says, now that I'm feeling more empowered with the methods, I can tweak more of these old recipes for sure. Just like I was talking about. Tangy. This was a really interesting dish. She poached a, uh, uh, posted and poached a quince in vanilla syrup. So notice that the fruit here wasn't boiled in vanilla syrup, right? It would be quince soup if it was boiled. Poaching is the correct method for soup. Thank you for posting that and poaching that, <laughs> Tangy. Um, I bet if you ran into Dan, uh, he would have uh, some choice vocabulary words for his dog who ruined the plans for a nice beef sandwich on a roll with asparagus for dinner by getting up on the table and eating the entire bag of rolls off the counter. Well, well, Dan is a carefree cook, so he quickly pivoted and he made this beef wrapped asparagus with hollandaise sauce and he saved the day so he wasn't the one in the doghouse that night. Uh, the baking bug has bitten Michael, alliteration there for you, <laughs> having done very little baking his entire life, he has discovered the correct mixing methods in web cooking classes, and now he cannot be stopped. He's making white chocolate chip cookies. He's making almond biscotti. He's done a double layer strawberry cake. He's doing slider buns. The guy is out of control. So nice to see someone expressing their art through cooking and baking. It's really, really cool. Uh, let's get back to the uh, true or false for today. Most of the nutrition in the potato is found in the skin. Sorry, the answer is false. I know. I know your mom told you that. No, don't throw away the skin. All the vitamins are there. That's just not true. Most of the fiber is in the skin, but the rest of the nutrition in a potato is pretty much 50-50 skin to flesh. So Yes, more fiber, but not more nutrition, so this is false. Hey, look, if you know someone who could use a holiday food vocabulary lesson so they can focus on the methods of cooking, so they can make the best family holiday dinner ever, please like, please share this video so we can all benefit from it. And if you're curious about wanting to create the best holiday meal ever with precision, with confidence, without stressing out over the holiday dinner or feeling like a caterer, 
Instead of a family member, register now for my new 2019 holiday cooking success class that's going to show you exactly how to plan, cook, bake, coordinate, and use leftovers effectively. All you got to do is go to webcookingclasses.com slash success to hold your spot in the next class. So until next Tuesday, everyone, where we're going to take the next few steps toward breaking the Carefree Cooks Code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your holiday cooking success. See you next Tuesday, everyone. Bye-bye.